We actually went to court against the USDA and we argued that these downed animals are diseased and diseased animals should not be allowed into the food supply. Their response to us was that it was legal and appropriate and common for diseased animals to go into the food supply. So we actually took them to the court and argued back and forth. Uh, the case was dismissed a couple of times. And then in de on December 16th, 2003, we won a significant victory that would allow our case to go forward, would allow us to conduct discovery, would allow us to get into their files and find out what they knew. Less than two weeks later, on Christmas Eve in 2003, the USDA announced that they had found mad cow disease in a downed cow. And you know, part of our case was also that downed animals are more likely to have mad cow disease. With that admission, we began settlement negotiations and the USDA agreed that no more downed cows should get into the food supply. Unfortunately, they put some loopholes in their regulations and still allowed them in. Uh, and it was recently exposed, as I mentioned last year, and now hopefully those loopholes will be closed down and downed cows will no longer be allowed to go into the food supply. But even if we're successful with that, downed pigs and other downed animals are still going into the food supply. And this is something we think is wrong and it's something we're going to continue working on. But this is a picture of downed animals in California. It's a picture of a downed cow that I took in Texas. She had been brought to the stockyard with her calf and because the calves sell to one group of buyers and the cows sell to another group of buyers. They were separated at the stockyard and the mother wanted to be with her calf and she was forcibly separated and in that process her neck was broken and that's why she became a downed animal and that's why her neck is over like that, like it is. And here's another picture of a downed animal that I took in New York State. And I'm just showing this is a common problem across the country. Uh, this is a calf who was sent to the stockyard on the day he was born. He was still wet from afterbirth. And this was a freezing day and he was dying of hypothermia. So I asked the local, the stockyard worker, what's going on with this calf? He said, well, I got to bury him later today. And I said, well, what if I took him off your hands? He said, sure. So I took the calf to a local veterinarian and she said, what are you wasting your time for? This calf has very little, little chance of survival and has no economic value, makes no economic sense. And I said, well, to me, it's not an economic situation. I just want to do what I can to help this individual. And finally, the veterinarian agreed to give him intravenous fluids. I took him back to the farm and watched over him day in and day out, and he recovered, and that's Opie. He ended up being a 3,000-pound cow at the farm. He lived a long, wonderful life, and I'm sad to say he died last year, but he lived with us for 18 years, and he was a, a peaceful presence on the farm. You would go into the barn, and he would, he was massive. I mean, he was like this high at the shoulder, and you would just go in there, and he was a gentle giant. You know, so you'd go right up to him, and he was, he was, he was an amazing animal. But, but he, Opie, was born to a dairy cow, and for dairy cows to produce milk, they have to be impregnated and give birth they produce uh, 10 times more milk than they would normally. So these cows are pushed very, very hard. They're hooked up to these milk machines a couple times a day, and the milk is sucked out of them. In a healthy environment, a cow would live 20 years, or sometimes longer. But on modern dairies, they're sent to slaughter after just about three or four years in production, and their bodies are worn out. This is a picture that was actually sent to me by a dairy industry veterinarian of a downed cow. The dairy industry is the number one contributor to the downed animal problem. But this dairy industry vet was upset with what he was seeing, so he actually took this picture and sent it to me and said, please do what you can to stop this. This is wrong, it should not be allowed. So the downed animal issue is a byproduct of the dairy industry. Another byproduct of the dairy industry is the veal industry. You know, as I mentioned, for a cow to be profitable on the dairy, she has to have a calf. And on modern dairies, they have a calf every year. The female calves are raised to become milking cows, but the male calves are useless to the dairy industry, so, they, so the veal industry was actually created to take advantage of this plentiful supply of unwanted male calves. So the veal industry has literally been born out of the dairy industry. And as many of you probably know, you know, cows raised for veal are taken from their mothers at birth, chained by the neck in small crates, unable even to turn around, and that's how they live their entire lives. But they're not the only animals who are confined in, in small spaces. This is a picture of sows, female breeding pigs, 
in gestation crates. And they call them gestation crates because this is where these animals are kept during their gestation period, which is about four months long. And then right before giving birth, they move them into a similarly confining crate called a farrowing crate where the sow still can't turn around, but there's a little space on the side for her piglets where they can nurse for about three weeks, then the piglets are taken away, and then the, 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 the sow is returned back to a gestation crate. And in these gestation crates, they experience physical as well as psychological problems. Physically, you can see some sores on this one's front leg. They also sometimes have sores on their shoulders or on their sides from constantly rubbing against the bars. They're standing on concrete floors. They don't have any straw bedding. So they also have uh, foot and leg problems. And in terms of psychological problems, stereotypical behavior, routine, repetitive behavior, such as bar biting, is, is a stereotypy. And it's a neurotic behavior that exists when these animals are confined in such a way. Um, they're basically driven mad. And another of the confinement systems I'll mention are battery cages. This is how egg-laying hens are kept in small wire cages uh, that are lined up in rows, stacked in tiers, and huge factory warehouses that'll hold about 100,000 birds per building. And the birds are packed so tightly they can't stretch their wings. They're constantly rubbing against the wire bars. Their feathers rub off. They have bruises and abrasions on their bodies. So these are battery cages. Now, those three confinement systems are now starting to be challenged. You know, veal crates, gestation crates, and battery cages were recently outlawed in California. When California citizens voted yes on Proposition 2, it passed by a, a margin of 63 to 37. A massive victory, and the industry is now reeling. They are stunned by this. They have spent about $9 million trying to defeat that measure, but they lost by a landslide. So, Citizens do not accept this kind of cruelty, um, and the industry is routinely perpetrating this kind of cruelty. And I believe change is inevitable, and these practices are outside the bounds of acceptable conduct in our society, and, and I think change is now just starting to happen, thankfully. But we have a long way to go, and the industry is, you know, very slow to make changes, but, but we're starting to see some movement. Now, I just showed a picture of egg-laying hens. This is a hatchery that hatches egg-laying hens, but both egg-laying hens and meat-type birds are hatched at a similar kind of facility. But they're two very distinct breeds. The meat-type birds have been genetically bred to grow very fast and very large. They grow twice as big and twice as fast as normal. The egg-laying hens have been genetically bred to put all their feed energy into egg production, but they don't grow very big or very fast. So the, at the hatcheries that hatch the egg-laying hens, you have males born as well as females. The males do not lay eggs. They don't grow fast enough to be raised profitably for meat. So they're literally thrown away at the hatchery. This is a picture I took behind a hatchery in Pennsylvania, a dumpster full of unwanted male chicks. Um, you could hear chirping coming out of this dumpster. Then I went to another hatchery in Pennsylvania. I visited it in the afternoon one day and they described how they were disposing of the unwanted male chicks. They said it was done very humanely. They put them in trash cans. They put gas in the trash can. And because the gas is heavier than air, it sinks to the bottom. So the chicks are suffocated and they die painlessly, is what I was told. I went back the next day and I saw trash cans full of chicks who were alive and who were dying of suffocation because those were on top of them. Then I also saw them taking some unwanted chicks and putting them in an auger, which is like a big screw. And as it turns, it moves material. Usually it's used to move sand or grain or something like that. It's not used to move living animals. But in this particular case, it was moving these unwanted chicks and some eggs that hadn't hatched yet. And uh, some of the chicks were being dismembered on this thing. Some were dying, but some were surviving and the auger was taking them to this, which is a manure spreader. They were going to be spread on the field as manure, live animals. This is a picture I took at an egg farm in New Jersey. It's a trash can full of dead hens, you know, because in these battery cage operations, the hens die. You know, these conditions are very bad. So one of the main things that people do who work at these places is they go through the barns and pull out the dead bodies. So they often have, you know, piles of dead birds or trash cans full of dead birds and 
So I came across this trash can and took a picture of it. Then I noticed there were a couple of live birds in there. So I took them to the farm and we took care of them. But then we tried to prosecute the egg factory for cruelty to animals. And when we were in court, the egg factory's lawyer argued that they could legally treat the birds like manure. And the judge said, isn't there a difference between live birds and manure? And their attorney res responded saying, no, your honor. They were literally arguing in court that there's no difference between live animals and manure. That's how bad it's gotten.